O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And even at this stage of life, we've come through enough to know that mighty are the works of your hand. That when you move on our behalf, none can stand against us. Lord, teach us tonight how to be aligned with your will and your word that our lives might not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Thank you for this community in which we gather for my neighbor on my left and my right. May they prove now to be fertile soil that the seed of your word may be planted and they reap the fruit in due season that they do not faint or grow weary. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to move a little fast tonight. Um, won't be before you too long. But I've really been wrestling with tonight's lesson for quite some time and I'm glad that we're here tonight. It, it actually uh, probably came to me back in November and we're just trying to find the right time and place to schedule. We were going to try to do this in December, but the Holy Spirit said otherwise. And so tonight, I'm excited to be able to share with you um, about being a Christian in a multi-faith world. Um, so if we can put the first PowerPoint up, I'll control it from there, Bobby. Thank you. Um, as soon as we get this up. Okay. Leave that up. I'll take it from here. Um, in the world today, in terms of religion, there are two trends um, that are very noticeable and statistically proven. The very first trend is that Christianity is on the decline in America. Um, although many, I think the numbers right now in the last Gallup poll in 2015 said that about 75% of Americans identify with Christianity, the reality is if you translate that into actual attendance and worship and membership in churches, that number drops almost to 40%. Um, so the number of people who say they're Christian may still be relatively large in America, but those who would identify as practicing Christians, that number is on the decline. Um, that happens all across the board in Protestant churches and Catholic churches, um, that those numbers are going down. But the second trend that is visibly noticeable in American society is that other religions are on the rise, uh, particularly Islam, uh, which really gained a foothold in the late 70s in America um, and began to blossom since. Um, the second highest group that's growing are the Buddhists, believe it or not. Uh, so between Muslim and Buddhist, uh, the majority, the percentage of Americans who identify in that last Gallup poll was about 13%, whereas 40 years ago, that number was 2%. And so the growth of other world religions in the United States is exponentially growing faster, and the rate of Christianity is on the decline, which simply means this, that in the world in which we live, we interact with, on a daily basis, people of different faiths. Um, whereas many of us would identify as being Christian, um, every day you're going to interact with someone who is either of a another religion or of no religion. As a matter of fact, how many of you have close friends that are Muslim? Anyone have friends that are Muslim? Okay. How many of you all know a Buddhist? How many of you all know an atheist? How many of you all know some demons? <laughs> um, we, we interact with people of different uh, faith on a regular basis, even within our own ethnicity now. There used to be a time when you could take for granted that if someone was African-American, they were Christian. Um, that is not necessarily the case anymore. Um, the percentage of those who were born and raised and lived in church are much smaller. I, I'm a child of the 70s, and I know that we lived in an environment where um, if you didn't go to church on Sunday, you were a heathen on your way to hell, right? Um, and, you know, we could always tell the folk who didn't go to church because if when we got out of church, and we were one of the faster Baptist churches, so we started at 11, we finished about 2.15, 2.30. That was, that was fast. If you got home and your friends were in their play clothes already, you know they didn't go to church. Now, you're old if you know what play clothes and <laughs> church clothes are, right? You got to take the church clothes off with the play clothes on. So we came home, and Lamont and JJ and Marcus were in their uh, play clothes. I was like, man, y'all ain't go to church today. Y'all going to hell. Um, but that, that's no longer the case anymore, that there are 
The church is in competition with a whole lot of things, and it's quite possible that the majority of black people you run into are not Christian. Um, they may identify, be part of that 70%, but active and involved in life of the church, that number drops significantly to 40. Um, so we interact with people of different faiths all the time. The challenge is that history has proven many of the wars in history of humanity prior to the 20th century, the predominant factor in those wars was always religion. That faith causes fights. Um, now, if, if you're casual about things, it, it may not bother you, but if you've ever gotten into a heated debate with someone of another religion, you know that's not something you just easily walk away from. That, that burns you up. You, you're calling every sanctified person. You know you're getting scripture. You're meeting with your pastor. You got to get answers because that's a fight we don't like to lose. Nobody likes to lose a faith fight. So it's, it's highly probable that with so much interaction with other faith that we can wind up in tense moments. And that happens not only in interfaith, and by interfaith I mean Christian versus non-Christian, but also ecumenically. Um, I don't know why that came out so small. Um, let's go to, okay. Ecumenically, so if, you, if you're not familiar with the term, ecumenism means within Christianity. So interfaith will be Christian interaction with non-Christian or other. Ecumenically or ecumenism is a reference to Christian interactions. So you've probably had some interactions with other Christians that you don't like losing that debate over. Um, of different, if you've ever, I, I really don't put Jehovah Witness as Christian. Um, no, and that, that's real because they don't confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, I've, I've gotten in arguments with Seventh Day Adventists about what day we're supposed to worship on. And, and I'm not going to, can I, can I give you a word of warning? I'm just, just so you know me, you don't want to argue Bible with me, right? Because I'm going to win no matter what the cost, no matter what I got to do, uh, no matter how much I got to cheat, I'm going to win because I, I, like, I don't like losing a Bible, a Bible argument. Um, I believe that, that that's just sacrilegious for a Baptist. Um, I've gotten arguments with Pentecostals about whether you need to speak in tongues. Um, and folk laying hands on me until, you know, you ain't gonna force me to talk in tongues, right? <laughs> like, just, LeVar, my defense is already up. You tell me I got to, and you, gonna put, you put your hands on me all day long. I am not talking in tongues. Yeah, you're not gonna make me do anything. But um, that, that faith, it's sensitive to us. Um, that's a major thing for us. And there are a few reasons why faith is so critical in our religion. Number one, it's part of our self-identity, and it's at the core of how we identify ourselves. If, if I ask you to define yourself in three or four words and Christian wasn't at the top of, in that top three, I would suggest to you that you really aren't passionate about your walk with the Lord, right? But if I ask you to identify yourself with three adjectives and Christian is in the top three or even at the top one, that's how you identify, and when that is attacked, we feel as if we've been personally attacked, right? I, I take comments about Jesus Christ very seriously, right? Um, my mother and Jesus Christ, you talk about either one of those, right? And it's gonna be a problem and a misunderstanding. Um, I don't even like watching stuff on television that mocks Jesus or mocks the church. Um, I don't think that stuff is funny. Um, so when comedians are going in on the church, I try not to laugh, you know, I just don't. <laughs> I just don't think that's funny, um, well, a little bit. And, uh, but I definitely, I definitely don't take Jesus jokes. I don't take Jesus jokes at all. But the second thing that makes it so tense, and this is important, because we want to claim that God is on our side, right? That if all of these different religions exist, there historically has been this desire to suggest that the true God is with us. And there's some deep implications for believing that God is on your side and not with someone else. If you think about it for a moment, when you think and believe that God is with you and not with someone else, that will validate your disrespect and distreatment of people because they're not real. They're not godly. They're not holy. God isn't with them. They're evil. And so historically, the church, um, Christians, 
have responded in one of two ways to other religions because the Christian doctrine has always been that God is on our side. God is with us. We are the people of God. One of the first ways to deal with it is conversion. Uh, we believe that, um, that if someone is not Christian, that they ought to be converted. And historically, the church, Christianity, has dealt that in two ways. One is through missionary work. We colonized the nations. We sent missionaries in to preach the good news, to give them Bibles, to baptize their heathen souls. Um, if that doesn't work, then Christianity has always been guilty of trying to convert through oppression, slavery, and violence. Uh, when, you read, um, when you read documents of our founding fathers, um, and you look at how American ideology endorsed slavery, part of the rationale was that they were saving our souls. Heathen Africans who did not know Jesus Christ needed to be exposed to the gospel, and they thought slavery was the best way to do it. Now, you and I both know that was not the reason, but it's amazing how you can justify certain evils when you want it to be legitimate in your eyes. So the Christian model has been, one, we're going to convert. So if you don't know the Lord, if you're not Christian, um, if you're Buddhist, if you're Muslim, we're going to convert, and we're going to try that through missionary work or through violence. And that is where you get many of the wars in antiquity, especially like the Crusades. You know, you get this Christian push into Muslim countries to try to convert Muslims to Christianity, only to find out Muslims don't convert easily. Um, right? They, they, they don't just call on Jesus easily. Um, the second way, this is even more deadly, is through eradication and extermination. Um, that when you believe God is on your side and not someone else's, you can very easily kill with impunity. You can take life without believing that there's anything wrong. As a matter of fact, you can convince yourself that you're operating in God's will. Because God is with me, God is not with her, and therefore I have the right to take her life. That was at the foundational movement of the rise of Nazism. Nazism has to remove God from being the God of the Jews because if we believe that God is with the Jews, how can we exterminate? How can we initiate the Holocaust? So if you read the theology of the Third Reich, one of the very first movements of the German church was to redefine Christ and Christ's relationship with Christians and to put Christ against the Jews. And so when that theology is bought, now they're Germans. So you, you would wonder how could so many Germans be complicit with the Holocaust well, because they attack their theology first. Once their theology is changed and they believe that God is with us and God is against them, then the minute you put God against someone, you believe that you're acting in the will of God to claim their life. And so this is some serious stuff about dealing with other faith traditions. Um, historically, it has not gone well for Christianity. Um, and so today, what I thought we'd do is talk about what is my Christian obligation and duty as I live in a multi-faith world. If you live in a world filled with those who believe other than you, who may not confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who do not deem themselves Christian, well, the question I want to ask is, what do we do? How am I supposed to live in that environment? What has God called me to do? How do I live out the Great Commission in Matthew 28 that I ought to make disciples? Does that mean that every non-Christian I meet I should try to convert them to Christianity. How do I live out Acts 1 and 8, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, I will be a witness? Does that mean that every Muslim I meet, I need to try to convert? How do we deal with our evangelistic call? What do we do in a world where there's so many other different faith traditions? Well, the first question I want you to begin to ask yourself is this, and it's the question that shapes what category you're going to fall in. Because traditionally, Christians fall in one of three categories when it comes to dealing with other faith traditions. The question you need to ask yourself is, what is the possibility of the existence of salvation outside of Christianity? And I want you to think about that for just a second. What is the possibility of the existence of salvation outside of Christianity? Now, the sub-question you ought to be asking is, what is salvation? What do you throw, if I were to ask you uh, to give me some characteristics or words that you associate with salvation, um, 
Some of us probably say forgiveness of sin. Some would probably say relationship with God. Um, what falls under the category of salvation for you? Is it simply being a good person? Is it having a relationship with God? Is it having your sins forgiven? Is it having a home in heaven? What falls under salvation for you? As you think about that, the question then becomes, whatever is in that bucket, whatever is in that definition of salvation, do you believe that can exist outside of Christianity? Everybody understand the question, right? Well, I'm going to share with you the three common answers um, that have shaped much of Christian history, and I'm going to ask you to identify which group you're in. I may not raise hands because that may be embarrassing to some. No, we're going to raise hands. It's Kaya. It's fine. Um, <laughs> we realize that we're all, everybody, everybody's different in here. Um, so there are typically three answers about what, what you believe. Is there a possibility of salvation outside of Christianity? Three positions. Number one are the exclusivists. Everyone say exclusivists. Exclusivists. Exclusivists are the ones who believe that salvation is only in the name of Jesus Christ. This group says absolutely not. There is no possible salvation outside of Jesus Christ. This is the John 14, 6 folk. Who knows John 14, 6? Okay, uh, John 14, 6 is, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, right? Look, you was opening up your Bible, like, oh, John 14, 6, I got that. Uh, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Exclusivists hang their hat on John 14, 6. They hang their hat on Acts, uh, I think it's 17. There's no other name whereby we can't be saved other than the name of Jesus. So the exclusivists will say to you, Listen, I'm not, I'm not saying he's a bad person or she's a bad person. What I am saying is that salvation only comes through confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Exclusivist. By wave of hand, how many people here tonight are exclusivists? Is that What? You want to know your options? Wait, wait. The reason, the reason I'm waiting. Good point. Nobody said, well, I need to see the other options. Okay. No, no, no. The reason I ask this, because exclusivists know they're this. Right? Exclusivists know that you, well, I don't need to hear nothing else. Right? <laughs> if you ain't calling on Jesus, you ain't saved. Right? <laughs> right? So for the exclusivists, this, this, this is it. Right? So once again, exclusivists, only in the name of Jesus. Right? He's the way, the truth, and the life. All right. Exclusivists. We're going to mark exclusivists on the right-hand side, all right? We're going to put exclusivists over here, because when we think right, we think conservative. If you get all the way over to the left, you get the next group, the pluralists. The pluralists are those who believe, absolutely, a Muslim is saved, a Buddhist is saved. Pluralists tend to believe, there's a book, and I really don't want to recommend it unless you, unless you really like reading about the stuff by a brother named John Hick called God Has Many Names, right? And this is the pluralist. God has many names. What, what's the benefit of pluralism? Easy, peace, right? Because you acknowledge the salvation and the godliness of those who may worship or call God by a different name than you. So we're at peace. The pluralist says there's one God, people call him different names. The pluralist likes this illustration. Five blind men or blind women, we're in inclusive. <laughs> five, five folk <laughs> who are blind walk over to an elephant. One grabs the leg, one grabs the tail, one grabs the, the tusk, one grabs the trunk, okay? That's four, four, right. And <laughs> they're all asked to describe the elephant. Each one of them's description is different but they're all holding on to the elephant. And because humanity is inherently blind when it comes to God, we don't understand everything about God, the pluralist says that absolutely, the brother holding on to the trunk has the elephant, the one that's got the tail has the elephant. And even though the experiences of the elephant are dramatically different, it's the same elephant. 
These are the pluralists. Okay? Now, just so you know, when you talk about the exclusivists, let me tell you the denominations that typically fall with exclusivists, and then we'll get over to the pluralists. With the exclusivists in the first group, those are typically going to be your evangelical, apostolic, Pentecostal, and holiness folk. Um, um, you, you, do, you do not go in a Kojic church talking about the Buddhist knows the Lord. Okay. Um, they will take you downstairs and lay hands on you till you talk in tongues. Okay. Um, um, so those are, those are hardcore right wing. Um, nobody but Jesus. Evangelicals hang their hat on that. Part of evangelical is Believe that the Bible is supreme and that there's only salvation in Jesus' name. Okay. Evangelical on the right. On the left, the pluralists, these are what you know as particularly your Unitarians and Universalists. Okay. How many of you have ever seen that, the term UU? Universalism, Unitarianism. Okay. Universalism, Unitarianism are clearly pluralists. Right? You will go in a universal or Unitarian church and you may hear them praying to different gods because they believe in a universal God, and people call God by different names. I don't, I'm not trying to, um, I don't want to oversimplify it because it's a little bit more complicated than that, but let me simply say that the universalism, Unitarianism falls under the pluralists. Okay. Now, watch this, Marcia. How many pluralists in the room? Wow. I appreciate your honesty and your boldness. Most time, black folk don't raise their hand on that one. Because mm -hmm. it's Jesus and nobody else. Amen. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, pluralists tend to be more peaceful than exclusivists. Right? Exclusivists go to war. Pluralists, not so much. Because they see a God in everyone. As a matter of fact, there's a movement in pluralism now that sees the essence of God in every living creature, right? So the pluralist says God is in everyone. Whether you acknowledge or call or pray or worship or never read a Bible, there's an acknowledgement of a God in you. Okay. Now, in the middle are the inclusivists, all right? The inclusivists answers the question by saying, you know, there could be, there could be. I'm Christian, but I'm not ready to say that the Muslim is not saved, if that's the word we're going to use. I don't think Muslims use the word saved. Buddhists definitely don't. But remember, I asked you to define what is salvation. And so whatever you put in that bucket, an inclusivist will say, I believe that a Buddhist sister can have what's in the same bucket that I call salvation. Salvation is a very Christian term, and I, I hesitate to use it to describe other religions. As a matter of fact, one thing I think I want to do in Kaya um, and if someone will hold me accountable, I want to give you a broad spectrum of the seven great world religions and what they identify as a human problem, what the answer is, and what their holy scriptures are, just so you can be well-versed in the major world religions, all right? So we're going to come back and do that at one Kaya. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The inclusivists um, say there possibly is. There's possibly salvation, however we define it, in other world religions. Go with me to John chapter 10 real quick. This is... In John 14, we have that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And exclusivists raise their hand. He, nobody but Jesus. Okay. Go to John 10. Okay. Boy, I know this is Kai. I don't hear pages turning. Everybody's on their app. All right. Uh, it's amazing how fast you can find scripture with your app. John 10, let's start in verse 15. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now, you can, you can interpret this in various ways. I'm going to tell you that there's some inclusive interpretation that makes reference to Jesus suggesting that there are other sheep that he dies for that are not part of the flock, i.e., are not disciples, are not Christian but that his death even covers them. We're going to talk about a preacher that had that experience and, and what that did for him in just a moment. Uh, the inclusivists say it's possible. There, there may be salvation elsewhere. 
Now, how many of you all are inclusivists? By the way, my hand is raised. Okay, I'm raising my hand. I'm an inclusivist. Now, if we set exclusivist way here on the right, and we put pluralist all the way over here on the left, right and left, imagine if you will, I'm gonna try to do this right, imagine this is the whole box for inclusivists. I mean exclusivists, the speaker, the whole box for exclusivists, right? And this box right here is the whole box for pluralists. The spectrum of inclusivists runs this whole gamut, okay? Because you can be an inclusivist and kind of be a little bit more over here, right? right? Or you can be an inclusivist and kind of be more on this side. You know, you still claim Christianity, but you're more of a believer that, yeah, it's, it's more possible. Whereas over here, this is the group, these are the inclusivists like me that say, you know what, it's, pro it's probable. I don't know, I ain't ready to say. I, I know Jesus, and that's kind of where I'm going to stand. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I ain't putting nobody in hell, but if you ask me, I'm going to tell you, you better try Jesus, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. He'll make a difference in your life. <laughs> um, you know, whereas the pluralist is kind of like, well, you know, I, I, if I'm an inclusivist on the pluralist side, I'm like, you know, I love the Lord and Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I recognize that that Buddhist brother, you know, it's about him and his walk with the Lord. We all good. Everything's fine. I'm not, I'm not trying to convert him. Um, I want to know more about his religion, right? So the gamut is really large with the inclusivist. So let me share with you who's on this side, what denomination. So if if that box are the apostolics, the Pentecostals, the evangelicals, and the holiness, and those are Unitarian Universalists, then over here in this area are the Baptists and the Methodists, right? We're, we're just a little bit right of center, right? If you get a little bit left of center, you're probably dealing more with Episcopals and Presbyterian, okay? Um, and then you're making your way all the way, to, and when you're really close, like right here, right next, your United Church of Christ, your UCC, right? UCC is about as far left as you can get and still be an inclusivist without taking one step over. The United Church of Christ, if they take one more step, they're universal Unitarians, right? But uh, the Baptist folk, we, 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 we typically stand a little bit right over here, and some of us, you know, we do this every now and then, you know, we, you know I'm, I don't know. Um, so think about where you are. There are a couple factors that help determine where you are. Okay, question? Um, how much more than five years? Has this been convert? You're jumping ahead, but you see where we're headed. She asked a very good question. Are we called to convert, share, what does it mean? And one of the things, I'm gonna allude to something tonight that has to come up in another Kaya about what our assignment is in the world, okay? But I'm gonna come up on that um, in just a moment. Couple factors determine what, what, where you stand. Uh, there are a couple of the reasons why an exclusivist is an exclusivist or a pluralist is a pluralist or an inclusivist stands to the left, stands to the right or to the left. There are a couple of factors that I think have shaped that. Okay. Number one is how you personally came to experience and accept Jesus Christ. Your road to salvation will definitely determine where you stand on the spectrum. If, if you were like me and you were raised in church and your salvation was not some dramatic, life-changing event because you got baptized when you were six, then you're probably more center or even over this way because for you, the Lord has always just been in your life. It's nothing, it's, it's not that you don't have as much passion, but you don't have that grand, the Lord saved me out of my stuff. Now, if, if you got saved later in life, like high school beyond, college beyond, and you were out there and got saved, and the Lord pulled you out of some real stuff, you stand here all day long, because you know, <laughs> right? Like, hey, hey, let me testify. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Nobody greater. <laughs> he, he, like, like, the Lord saved me. And because your conversion is so passionate and the Lord has done so much, you can't help but believe, yo, this is the only way, right? Because I know what this did for me. Whereas as, if you accept the Lord as a child, 
You don't have that kind of experience and that kind of conversion, that kind of passion, so you're more open and willing to believe because you're not as firm in that. that that's, not, that's not how you were saved. But how you experience and accept Jesus Christ has a tremendous play on how you view other religions. If you know that you tried a whole lot of stuff, but when you called on Jesus, right, things changed. Hey, that's a simple, look at him, the folk getting happy, hey, hello, I'll learn. Uh, now, if you were young, it will be dependent, if you receive the Lord as a child, it'll be dependent upon who your role models of faith were, right? Who instructed you? What denomination did you come up in? What preaching did you hear? Who was your Sunday school teacher? Those people shape you early, so you could have received the Lord at an early age and still be way in the exclusivist side because you were raised Pentecostal, right? You were raised apostolic. You were raised holiness. And that can have a real effect. Number one, how you experience them, Christ. Number two, your exposure to people of other faith and religion. Nothing will transform you more than meeting someone who is of another tradition. And they have a way of destroying your stereotypes or you see them as a good person, right? Some of us know some non-Christians who are a thousand times better. <laughs> than some church folk you know, right? Exposure of definition by, by the very experience of it broadens your horizon. So if all you thought was Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden you meet a Buddhist who has the joy and the peace of the Lord, they may not call it the same thing, but you see the same thing in them that you see. You see them meditating and praying the same way you do. You see them trying to live right with people the same way you are. You see them giving of themselves the same way you are. It's hard to look at that person and say, well, they don't have salvation because you've been exposed. It's, that's why one of the worst things in the world is to be born in a place, live in a place, and die in a place, and never visit any place else, right? Okay. Someone who has not traveled and not exposed will more than likely have a closed mind. Right? Um, don't tell me you don't like to eat something if you ain't tried it. Mm? I, mm. Let me give you a real quick story. I um, when I went to seminary in 1994, um, I didn't believe in women preaching. I was old school Baptist. My dad was a pastor. If women wanted to speak, they spoke from the floor at the same uh, podium they read the announcements from, right? And they were called evangelists or missionaries. Um, the National Baptist Convention to this day has not had a female preacher in a general session yet, which is why they don't get Alpha Street money no more, but that's another issue. Um, <laughs> Um, hey, yeah, hey, man, that's right. That, mm -mm. I can put your money in something like that. That ain't good. But anyway, I didn't believe in female preachers. So I went to seminary. What, what changed me? Zena Jacques. In my class, called to the Lord, smarter than I was, could outpreach me any day of the week. And I had to come to a conclusion. Either she's an abomination or God has his hand on her. <laughs> right? right? So... It's one or the other, right? Um, either I stay in my position that women aren't called and she's an abomination, that, that that's principality and power using her, or I have to acknowledge God's hand is on her. Right? And once you're exposed to that, it'll change you. Listen, I'm, I'm not ashamed to tell you this because this is Kaya. I, I were, I'm so grateful to God to mature in my theology. One of the worst things in the world to do is have a theology at 45 that matches where you were at 25. Right? My understanding of God is so much bigger. In 1995, six, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts um, became one, the, we became the first state to sanction gay marriage. And in my 26 year old self, I went on record as saying there's no such thing as a gay Christian. And to this day at 45, I repent before the Lord for that statement. What changed me? Not only reading the Bible better and trying to love better, but meeting some LGBTQIA brothers and sisters 
who love the Lord and serve God, and I could not say they weren't born again. Right? Exposure will transform you. And until, until you're exposed, it's easy to put somebody in the other bucket. Your exposure to people of other faith and tradition will challenge what bucket you stand in. I bet those who are universalists, they raise their hands, I bet all of you all know some people who are devout in another faith. And that matters to you. Right? Another one. Your position on morality versus confession. Let me see if I can explain this. Is your understanding of salvation based more on whether someone confesses Christ or whether someone lives like a Christian? Right? right? Is it the word and the confession or is it the lifestyle? Right? For most of us, we look at the life. And if you really believe that salvation is more dependent upon what I see than what you say, you're probably over here more than you know. Because you can see and identify good people who may not claim Christ as their savior. And the question you've got to wrestle with are, what does that mean in their relationship with God? And on the flip side, you can see folk who make the confession but don't live it in any way, shape, or form. So here's a question I always throw out that messes the, exclu the exclusivists up, right? Because the, the danger of the exclusivists, right? The exclusivist position, all the exclusivists, raise your hand again. All the exclusivists, raise your hand. Uh-uh, no, see? No, no, no. No, no, no. No, 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 no. That number went down, okay? I'm like, well, you know, now that didn't explain it, you know. <laughs> we'll go over here. <laughs> uh, exclusivists, raise your hand. Okay, exclusivists. Here's what you got to deal with. And I'm not saying you're wrong. This isn't the right or wrong. Here's what you got to deal with. Y'all putting a whole lot of people in hell. Now, I'm not saying you are, right? <laughs> right? But the exclusivist position has to wrestle with, what if I'm born in India and never hear the gospel and my parents are Buddhist or Hindu and I'm a practicing Hindu? You got to make peace with saying that that person is not saved. And the corollary, if you're going to be exclusivist and right wing, is that where there's no salvation, there's only but one other option. Damnation. Right? And that's what the fourth one is. You know what to really change your theology? What do you really believe about hell and damnation? How many of you all know the name Carlton Pearson? Carlton Pearson. In the late 80s, Carlton Pearson was the poster boy for Pentecostalism. Oral Roberts protege, the heir apparent to all that Oral Roberts would taught and believe. Carlton Pearson was synonymous with Azusa. Okay? You need to look it up, okay? If you don't know these terms, look it up. Pentecostalism has the best. Carlton Pearson was arguably one of the prominent singing voices of Christianity in the late 80s, his albums still, I still listen to them today, are to take you right into worship. Absolutely. Carlton Pearson sang about the joy of the Lord, and he talks, he tells testimonies about being raised in old school churches where, you know, where the ladies wore them stockings, they so thick you couldn't see through them, and they had, you know, like, just, just he was, he was, if this is, he was way, he was here, right? <laughs> He, he's way over here. That's, that's where Carlton Pearson is. One of the greatest interviews I've ever heard was NPR used to have a series called This American Life. Um, I really want you to Google this when you get home. It's, it's an amazing, amazing interview. It's about an hour long. They interview Carlton Pearson on This American Life in 2005. And the interview was called Heretic. Carlton Pearson went from way over there past the exclusivists. He thought exclusivists were going to hell. I mean, he was way over there. <laughs> and now Carlton Pearson stands in the Unitarian bucket, right? He stands right here. He was pastoring a church in Oklahoma 
arguably 10,000 people. He begins teaching and preaching universalism. Membership drops, he's thrown out. He loses everything. Oral Roberts denies him, we'll never mention his name. His picture is taken off of everything at Oral Roberts University. It's as if Carlton Pearson never existed. What happens? You'll hear it in the interview, but this is what he said. His soul became disturbed about how many people were going to hell because they didn't confess in Jesus Christ that more than half the world, according to his theology, was going to hell. And he wrestled with God about how could you let so many people go to hell? And what he came to an understanding was that God told him that they're not, that the death of Jesus Christ was so saving that all were going. So Carlton Pearson rejected the theology of hell. He said he could, he could not sleep thinking about how many people would die and burn. The image of hell seared in his soul and the Lord delivered him from it and he went all the way over to universalism because your theology of hell and damnation will determine where you stand on this. If you're okay with that, if you can sleep with that, you, you can sit, all I'm saying, if, if you are exclusivist, just know you gotta be prepared to answer that within yourself. That's a whole lot easier for the universalists because they're not putting, not, I don't want to use the term putting people in hell, but they don't easily suggest that someone's going to hell because of the religion they do or do not have in their hearts. So where you stand on this makes a major difference. Google it when you get home. NPR, This American Life, Carlton Pearson. It is one of the most phenomenal interviews I've ever heard in my life. You'll enjoy it. So, oh, excuse me, real quick. Um, so I started as an exclusivist because um, I was raised in an old school Baptist church. Uh, we didn't learn anything other than Jesus. And now I find myself a little bit more on this side, right around here. How did I get here? Easy, it was two things, exposure to others and the whole concept of hell and damnation. That bothered me. Someone asked me a question, Joseph, in seminary that I won't forget. If you're an exclusivist, are you ready to be in heaven with Hitler while Gandhi is in hell? That, that's just a question that messed me up because Hitler was a professing Christian. Now, whether we, let's not say, but if, 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 <laughs> if we talk about confession, Hitler confessed Christ. Gandhi does not. And according to the exclusivists, Gandhi's in hell. Hitler's in heaven. That messed me up. And I'm not here to make you think what I think. I just want to make sure you're thinking. You have to come to your own answer on this. There's a lot at stake in this. Um, our respect for life is tied up into it. Now, I'm not saying an exclusivist doesn't value life. But typically, those who have killed in the name of God have been over on that side. Absolutely distorting the true faith. But that side is prone to fanaticism. That side is prone to devaluing life. That side is prone to engaging in war and oppressions and colonization and slavery. Because when you believe that someone does not have the essence of God in them, that they are not saved, you can treat them any way you want. What's at stake in it? Our evangelistic call. What are we supposed to do? We'll get to it in a minute. What's at stake? If you're all the way over here in universalism, are you now saying that anything goes? As long as you're a good person? As long as you believe in something? One of the, anything pushed to an extreme gets distorted. One of the distortions of universalism is this reducing everything to um, the golden rule, right? Just do unto others as you have them do unto you when it gets distorted, that that's what this bucket says. As long as you're a good person, as long as you believe in something, or even if you don't believe in something. I've seen atheists at Universal Unitarian churches, right, enjoying 
or serve, but don't, not believing in a God, believing in humanity. Right? Um, there's a lot at stake. So for me, the question is not what bucket you stand in, whether you're an exclusivist, a pluralist, or an inclusivist. I'm not trying to convert you. What I do want to ask you, no matter where you stand, are a few questions. Number one, would you turn with me your book to, a Bible to Micah? Um, if you go to Matthew and just go to the left, a few books you'll get there easier. <laughs> go to Micah. Micah, let's go to chapter six. Because for me, you know, I don't like to put everything on one verse, but this verse is so critical. Because no matter, whenever you interact with someone who believes differently than you, I want you to remember Micah 6 and 8. So if you are interacting with a Buddhist, I want you to remember Micah 6 and 8. If you don't believe homosexuality is a God-given lifestyle and you're in the presence of a homosexual brother, I want you to think about Micah 6 and 8. Because this is where it boils down to for me. Not whether they believe like you, but how you treat them. Micah 6 and 8. He has shown you, O man, <clears throat> O woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Here are the three things God requires of us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. So whenever you're interacting with someone who believes differently than you, I want you to ask two, three questions. What does justice look like here? Now, one of the things I found as I began to study Greek, and you all know that translations are treason, that if you don't really read the Bible in the original language, you gotta trust someone else to have translated correctly for you. You may not know this, but every time you see righteousness in the New Testament, the Greek word literally translates justice. That righteousness with God is only seen in just relationship to each other. So what does it mean to be just with a lesbian sister? What does it mean to be just with a Buddhist? What does it mean to be just with an atheist? Because God grades our Christianity based on our interaction with others who are different. So what does justice look like? It says to love mercy. The second question I want to ask is, what does mercy look like in this relationship? I tell you what mercy doesn't look like, telling someone they're going to hell. I tell you what mercy doesn't look like, judging someone because they believe differently than you. I firmly believe that my assignment as a preacher is not to preach the road that leads to hell. I'm only called to preach what I believe is my conviction of the road that leads to relationship with God. I'm going to come to a passage of scripture in just a moment for that. Mercy requires a different mindset when you deal with people. God is looking at you to see, can you be merciful? There's a book I just finished reading called Beyond Heterosexism in the Pulpit, and one of the authors argued that to be made in the image of God means that we have the ability to love like God, to be merciful like God, to be faithful like God, to be honest like God with each other. And that sin happens when we fail to operate in the faithfulness, the love, the mercy, and the goodness of God with others the way God has done it to us. Right? That that's where sin comes in. It's not some long list of stuff in Leviticus. It's am I treating you the way God treats me? Right? So mercy, justice, and then to walk humbly with God. You know what humility literally means? It, it's almost a taking us oneself down, recognizing that I'm really not all that. And to walk humbly with God means that I walk in a way that I realize that I am only who I am because of what God has done for me. Right? And I have no, I have no standing to judge anyone else. Because you remove God from me, I'm as bad as anything and anyone you've ever seen in life. And God is the one who keeps me. 
that I, I humble myself. I am nothing of myself. It's only because of God. And therefore, I, I tell people all the time, listen, I can only give an account for me. I can't tell you the road to salvation for your life. I can tell you how I got to where I am. And that is through my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know where Islam leads. I don't know where Buddhism goes because I'm not in that tradition. I don't know where the Hindu goes. I can only tell you what I believe the Christian goes. There are many ways for you to get home, right? I don't know all of them. I just know, the, listen, I, I can tell folk how to get to my house. And someone say, well, it's easy to go 295. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you go this way and that way, you'll get to my house. I ain't going to tell you because folk are weird. I ain't telling you all where I look. <laughs> I'd had enough trouble in my life. Amen. Um, remind me to do a Kaya on stalkers. Amen. We're going to do a Kaya on stalkers. Amen. We got agape here because some folk, some folk need mental health, help. Um, I don't know. I can only tell you the way I know and the road that I know. I promise you, when you get to heaven, if you get to heaven, if you get to heaven, <laughs> there are three things that are going to surprise you. Right? Write this down, tweet this correctly. Three things are going to surprise you in heaven. Number one, some folk are going to be there that you swore wouldn't be. <laughs> I guarantee you. You're going to look up and be like, what? He, he, he got it. <laughs> okay. Number two, number two, some folk ain't going to be there that you thought for sure enough were there. And the third thing that's gonna surprise you is you are there. <laughs> right? Because you know you better than anybody else knows you, and you know you ain't got no business. So if you get there, may I suggest that that be all you care about, amen. That, 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 I made it, that's the end of that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can only speak for myself. Uh, Micah 6 and 8, in every relationship with someone different, what does justice look like? What does mercy look like? And what does it mean to walk humbly with God in this relationship? To lower yourself. To not be judgmental. I don't care what you assume your assignment is as a Christian. To win the world, to convert, to evangelize. If you're not walking humbly with God, if you're not loving mercy, and if you're not doing justice, then you're not doing the work of God. All right. We have to come to grips with a few passages. You can write these down. Just want to reference them. Matthew 5 and 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. If I'm not making peace, then I'm not really a child of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now abideth these three, hope, faith, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So if I operate in, with anyone and I don't operate in the love of God, then I'm not operating in my true gift. Don't, don't, don't list all the gifts of the Spirit and talk about talking in tongues and you can't operate in love. You missed it. The greatest of these is love. That's what identifies us. 1 John 4, 7 through 11, this is what we know. God loves us. And he who loves, God knows how to love because if you don't know how to show love, you don't know God. So at the end of the day, anything I do with someone who's different than me whether it be in sexual orientation, whether it be in faith, whether it be in religion, whether it be in church, whether it be in color, whether it be in culture, if I don't do it in love, I'm not really acting in Christianity. Right? There's no way I can claim to be a Christian and operate in hateful speech, derogatory terminology, stereotypes, belittling people. That, that's not of the Lord. You'll never prove to me it is. The kingdom of God would be twice as large if more church-going folk act like Christians. Right? Acted in love. Right? Recognize I'm a sinner and I'm just grateful and prayerful that the Lord is having grace on me. And I, I got a log in my own eye. I can't deal with the, the speck in your eye. Um, to operate in that love ethic. Um, and where love is missing, Christ is not operating. Um, we are called to be witnesses. And I want you to think for a moment in a legal sense, what is a witness, right? To what my sister was arguing. Our assignment is to win, to make disciples through witnessing. Pair up Matthew 28 with Acts 1. 
You shall make disciples. How do you do it? By being my witness. Think for a moment, in a legal sense, what is a witness? What is a witness? Someone who's called to the stand, asked a question, and called to tell what they know. Here's what the witness is not. The witness is not the defense attorney. The witness is not the prosecutor. Right? The witness is not the judge. The witness is called to come to the stand, tell the truth as you know it, and get up out of here. So I would suggest to you that our best way of fulfilling our assignment to make disciples is by truly understanding what it means to be a witness. Listen, to be a witness doesn't mean that you have to argue for the reality of God. You don't have to defend Jesus Christ. You just have to witness to him. So stop feeling like you can't have an effect of leading someone to Christ simply because you don't know every verse of the Bible or you don't know all the theology or the questions you don't know how to answer. God never called you to do that. God called you to just be a witness of what the Lord has done in your life. Look, I don't know, but this is what I do know. I prayed and things changed. Now, I may not be explaining it, but you can't deny it. We witness through three ways. One, our conduct, how we operate in this world is a witness to the presence of Christ. There ought to be something different about the way we walk. There ought to be something different about the way we interact. Our conduct ought to be different. I take seriously that passage in 2 Peter. We are called to be a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. Right? That our, my actions ought to indicate that there's some Christ about me. Mm-hmm. Just by the, way I, by the way I deal with people, you ought to be able to see my interaction with people and know that something's strange about me. Mm-hmm. My character, integrity, honesty, courage, patience. Read Galatians 5, do all the fruit of the Spirit. They're about... 20-something gifts of the Spirit. I think there are nine fruits of the Spirit. And you're supposed to have all of them. You're not supposed to have every gift, but you are supposed to have every piece of fruit. So go ahead and read Galatians 5, your character, your conversation. What comes out of your mouth ought to give witness to the presence of Christ. I said this on Sunday at one service. Um, You all remember when Peter denies that he knows Jesus? Y'all didn't know John 14, so I got to ask. You know, I'm just trying to... <laughs> okay, okay. Who, 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 who remembers the story, right? Peter's outside. Jesus already said, you're going to act like you don't know me. Peter says, Lord, I'd never let that happen. And Jesus says, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter does. He denies that he knows Jesus three times because he's scared that if he's identified as a follower of Jesus, who they are trying and beating, he's going to be beaten. So in one time when he denies, the Bible says he talks to a young girl, and she says, no, no, you're one of them, right? And the Bible says he curses at her, right? He curses her. She hears the way he curses. She says, no, you you still, you one of them. (laughs) You don't even cuss right. Like, you, you, mm -mm, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Your conversation, like, Really what happens is she, she hears his Galilean accent, but uh, I heard a preacher once make fun of it that you can tell real saved folk because they, they can't even cuss right. So I was like, well, I must not be saved because, you, know, you know, I you know, I, I, can put some, I can put them together. <laughs> you, ever, you ever hear somebody cuss and be like, dang, God. Now, I know a preacher in Houston, not, not Cosby, but another preacher in Houston. Uh, he cussed so bad, I feel like I'm going to hell sitting in the car listening to him. <laughs> like, man, I ain't never heard them two words go together. Uh, you know, but, but there's something about my conversation. You know, Christian talk ought to be strange talk in the world. We don't sound like everyone else. We're not as pessimistic. We're not as quick to be hateful. We don't try to cut people with words. And I promise you, more people would have a better experience of Jesus if they had a better experience with us. Like if we just witness, you ain't got to defend, you don't have to quote John 14, 6, you don't have to put nobody in hell, just live what you believe. One of my favorite passages of scripture, and this is where we're ending, right on time. Can you turn to Genesis 18 with me? And I 
Now, if you're having trouble finding Genesis, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you can't find Genesis, I can't help you. Um, Genesis 18 is the account of Abram, Abraham interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Uh, by the way, those who were with us in January know that Sodom and Gomorrah is, has absolutely nothing to do with how people have traditionally translated it and interpreted it. That if you, if you go back to that Bible study series we had in January, I want to challenge you to think that Sodom and Gomorrah has anything to do with the city being destroyed because of homosexuality. Not at all. Genesis 18, again, verse 16. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? He says, Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. The Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grave, what you need to do some research on is understand what the sin is. The sin was not homosexuality. The sin was how they were treating the poor. You read it otherwhere. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Here it is. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? When I first read this, it hit me and stuck with me. Abraham is negotiating for the city. He says, God, are you really going to kill the righteous and the wicked? And here's what Abraham says. Surely the judge of the earth will do what is right. Abraham places the fate of the people of Sodom in the hands of God and says, surely God will do what is right. What do I think about a Buddhist and salvation? Surely the judge of the earth will do what is right. And what I know, I am not the judge of the earth, and neither are you. Is a good person who doesn't believe in Christ going to go to heaven? Surely the judge of the earth will do what is right. Will the Muslim brother or sister make it? Surely the judge of the earth will do what is right. I think if we break our fascination of who is in heaven and who is in hell, we could do a lot better on earth. Do a whole lot better on earth to love justice. I mean, excuse me, to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. What I want to do down the road is a little bit more on evangelism and witnessing. How is it that we do witness? How do we fulfill our assignment to make disciples? But if you don't walk away with anything tonight, please walk away with this. No matter where you are, exclusivist, pluralist, inclusivist, let the judge of the earth do what is right. And you walk humbly with God. You love mercy and you do justice. Amen. All right, let's get ready to get out of here. Let's get ready to get out of here. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to give a closing prayer. As always, if you're here tonight and you desire the best gift of life, which is to receive Christ the way some of us have and know that he's changed our lives, it will be the joy of our deacons and our ministers to witness to you about the power of Christ. Um, if you want prayer, there'll be some deacons and ministers down here that will be willing to pray with you. Um, and tonight as we close, I'm going to ask that if there's someone God put on your heart to pray for, for salvation. If there's someone you know, someone you love, that you know is just not in a place of joy and peace, and you know it's because they're not right with God, I want to pray over them tonight. And so here's what I'm going to ask to do, and everyone doesn't have to stand. If it's not you, remain seated. But if you know someone you want to intercede for tonight that's on your heart and mind, 
about their salvation, their walk with the Lord, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask everyone who, who doesn't have anyone to pray for to remain seated. But if you want to intercede for someone, just stand. You don't have to come to the altar, but if you would stand. If there's someone you want to pray for, a family member, a friend. As you close your eyes, I want you to see their face. And to yourself, I want you to speak their name. Lord, there's so much I don't know. But what I do know and I believe is that believing in Jesus Christ saves us not only from the damnation of the afterlife, but even the hell on earth we sometimes experience. I believe that Christ's death on the cross was so powerful that if all I do is believe and confess and walk into that, that my life has changed. That's been the experience of many of us in this place. And Lord, with faith in how you changed me, saved me, work in me, I now pray for that sister, that brother, who may not even know that what they're missing is the joy of salvation. They're looking for joy and peace and happiness in every place that will not ever provide it. So Lord, tonight I lift up their name in your hearing and ask a few things. Number one, that you would be as merciful to them as you've always been to me. Lord, I pray that they not reap everything they've sown. I pray, oh God, that you would spare their life, that they may come to know the joy of salvation. I pray, Lord, that you would use me as a vessel to witness to them through my conduct, my character, and my conversation. And Lord, I pray that you'd put your hand on them in whatever way you do. Lord, I don't know if you put your hand on them through Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism, but I give you the right to be the judge of the earth and to do what you need to do to bring them into relationship with you, that they may walk upright in this life, that they may have peace and joy, and that together we may make a change in this world. Lord, use us to be witnesses. We thank you for Kaya tonight. We pray now for June Kaya as you bring our special guest that it will be a phenomenal night. I pray, Lord, over our journey to Durham, North Carolina, that you would be pleased with all that we would do to proclaim your good news through Kaya in Duke University. Thank you for my neighbor tonight. May she rest in peace and awaken in joy. And may somebody on Thursday know she was at church on Wednesday night. In Jesus' name we pray.